West to Harmin Freon and welcome to yet another video. This will most likely be the last video I make before I see the Rings of Power, my dear friends. Oh yes, the highly anticipated reviews by European law concerning the Rings of Power approaching. And I will of course have to wait for the ship of Captain Jack Sparrow to arrive before I watch the event of the century. And then finally, finally provide you with my honest and very detailed review of the first two episodes. Now, of course, you know all about my predictions and what I think the show will be like. Nowhere close to what Professor Tolkien wrote. And even if we think past that, if you look past that, I think and my predictions are that the show will be mediocre at best. I predict that uh, the script will be horrible, that we'll, we will find ourselves in the midst of uh, <clears throat> a stew of confusion. And the only thing that anybody could rightfully praise or like would be the visuals. But do not forget about the fact that almost every big budget film today looks beautifully. I always say and admit that the Star Wars Disney films, they look nice. Oh, they are absolutely beautiful to look at because the practical effects and the CGI effects are on a very high level in our day and age. But if you're only satisfied with nice flashing images on the screen, yeah, I know, that's not enough, my dear friends, and especially in the case of something that is apparently and supposedly based on the works of the best fantasy writer of our times. Now, of course, I made a video about a very positive review that came out yesterday because people are already posting their reviews. There have been premieres and screenings already, so people have seen it. So reviews, both positive and negative, are coming. And this is the last review I've read and the last review I'm going to review myself. Yes, I'm going to review a review. But then I will wait and see for myself because I don't care about the opinion of anybody but myself. Let's see what Daily Mail Co. Uh, UK wrote, and I couldn't be more excited, because apparently um, this guy, Christopher Stevens from Daily Mail Co. UK, he didn't get charge keys by Amazon, he didn't get paid, I think, so his review is a bit different from the other ones. And he says, Christopher Stevens reviews The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. No turkey, however bloated and stupid, could ever be big enough to convey the mesmerizing awfulness of Amazon's billion dollar Tolkien epic. Oh, it starts promising. The budget for the project was a massive future gambling, one billion. It cost Amazon 250 million dollars alone just to secure the rights to the prequel. Aside from Sir Lenny Henry, the only well-known star is Peter Mullen. I haven't heard about any of them. In my country, Sir Lenny Henry has never been big, never been famous. Nobody knows him here. Although I know that in my comments, some of you write that he used to be big in the United Kingdom. Stephen says the script is cliché laden, the acting is dire and the pace is laden. That those are words that I have used, or similar words, that, you know, things that I have predicted. Turkey is not wor the word. No turkey, however bloated, could, be, uh, uh, could ever be big enough to convey the mesmerizing awfulness of Amazon's billion dollar Tolkien epic. This is a disaster dragon, plucked, spatchcocked with a tanker load of Paxo stuffed up its fundament, roasted and served with soggy sprouts. The Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. Amazon Prime is so staggeringly bad, it's hilarious. Everything about it is ill-judged to a spectacular extreme. The cliché-laden script, the directing, the leaden pace, the sheer inconsistency and confusion as it lurches between styles, where do we start? So far things that I have predicted. Let's start with the budget, a billion dollars, let that sink in, 1,000 million bucks, about eight 
160 million pounds. Such a colossal investment even for Amazon that industry rumor says the brand is gambling its entire future as a film production company. That's why I say wait for Captain Jack Sparrow to arrive, my friends. If this show fails, say inside us, executive could be forced to shut down Amazon Studios. <laughs> the book rights alone cost 250 million dollars. And what did Amazon get for that? This is not a remake of The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. This is a prequel based on the appendices. The, rel, uh, the reams of footness dumped by J.R.R. Tolkien at the end of his Rings trilogy, chronicling millennia of turgid historical fantasy. That's right, the unreadable bits. Well, they are readable and they are very important bits and they were not just dumped at the end <coughs> of um, The Lord of the Rings. But, yeah, well, they are notes, uh, a, a chapter worth of notes at the end of the book, that's true. But they are not readable, uh, I mean, they are readable. <coughs> uh, whoever thought there was a wise buy must have been smashed out of their minds on Miruvor, <laughs> the Elvish liquor. Yeah, I've heard that Jeffy Bezos um, enjoys other substances. This is quite different ones from uh, our world. There's no doubt we can see the budget. It casts a throbbing glow over the screen like a chestnut of gold. Ultra high definition computer graphics paint ivory cities in, mount in mountain passes and conjure gigantic monsters and palaces of dark magic. But magnificent visuals are meaningless if nobody knows who the audience is meant to be. Ah, and it is and it is impossible to guess whether the Rings of Power is meant for children, for hardcore fans, or for general viewers, because it fails them all. Ah, oh, I, I love this. One fight sequence features Elf Princess Galadriel in acrobatic se uh, action against an angry troll who pops up from off stage like an adversary in a Dungeons and Dragons board game. Galadriel, or Galadriel, as we should call her in the Rings of Power, more of it, Clark, cartwheels and whirls her enchanted sword before dispatching the giant fiend with a bloodless blow. It's highly stylized like a Japanese manga cartoon. Yeah, or anime, just, you know, <laughs> to be more precise and correct. And I have made a many, many, many videos about the fact that they have absolutely uh, got the, char the character of Galadriel and other characters, not just Galadriel, wrong. So I'm not going to comment upon her being Xena, the warrior princess, in this video. Just go back and watch my other videos on the matter. An episode later, the healer Bronwyn, Nana Zain Ban Miyar blah, 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 and her, her son fight an orc. And this time, the violence is as brutal as anything in Game of Thrones. They stab it, spear it, run through it, hang it, <laughs> and finally saw through its neck with a knife before Bronwyn, soaked in blood, displays the head as a trophy. Small children and persons of a nervous dispos di disposition should not watch. Oh yes, of course, because you have to show uh, a strong woman who, who can slay them orcs. This is going to be so cringy. I can't wait to laugh my way through the show. Then the tail flies back to the Harfords. Mm -hmm. Prehistoric hobbits that wear garlands of acorns and dress in rags as though they've escaped from the set of Wardle Gummidge. Led by Sir Lenny Henry, a Sadduck, the Harfoots talk in a garble of Jamaican, Irish and uh, Somerset accents. They're lovable and funny in a slapstick way. Poppy Proudfellow, Megan Riches trips on an expedition to scrum blackberries and falls flat in a puddle. When she lifts her muddy face to the camera, like Oliver Hardy, she sighs, enchanting. Half would land is cute until old Mr. Brandyfoot slips and snaps his leg with a crack that would make the cast of Casualty wince. <laughs> Uh, one disconnected style follows wildly after another. A static scene in which elves' journey by ship is conceived by a pre-Raphaelite painting. Each actor stocks still in silver armor, swords clasped to their chests, long hair rippling. I long hair. Oh, there's going to be long haired elves. Oh, we are so excited. Oh, Jesus. Eyes fixed on the horizon in a pierce awe. 
Inspired by a flock of birds, they live their voices in a heavenly choir. Oh no, you, they didn't go there. They didn't make it as cringy as that. Oh, I can't wait. There's a lot of quasi-religious imagery. The first episode begins with a cold Bible reading. There was a time when the world was so young, there had not been a sunrise. But even then, there was light. Well, I think, uh, mister, who wrote this review, I think you're referring to the law, the actual history of Middle Earth. Popular culture invents blether like this to replace real religion. <laughs> it's Scientology for the superhero movie era. Yeah, there are things that the guy who wrote this review is getting absolutely wrong, but um, it's clear that he didn't like the show. And apparently he's not a, a, a Tolkien fan from what I'm reading. He really doesn't know much. So there you go. Yeah, ge yeah gave way to yeah. Century gave way to century. The narrator continues. Oh, as if they wanted to get very close to Peter Jackson prologue to uh, The Fellowship of the Ring. And already this reviewer was giving way to laughter. Oh yes, I can't wait. Soon every fresh clunker provoked such hoots that I had to keep pausing to gather my composure. It is said that the wine of victory is sweetest for those in whose bitter trails it is fermented, says the elf Elrond, Robert Aramayo to Galadriel. And I'm off again. Now, my prediction is, I'm be, rest assured, I, I'm sure that come this weekend, or really before the end of the week, when my review is up, I'm going to be saying that uh, the script looks as, uh, or sounds, it is as if it ha had been written by... Um, an eight-year-old kid trying as much as possible to write a fantasy book. So cringy as hell. If but a whisper of a rumor of the threat you perceive proves true, he goes on, until I'm weeping with laughter. Bronwyn and her boyfriend, are on the ear of the elf, share some marvel ex exchanges. I must follow the passage, he tells her, pointing to an underground cavern. You don't know what's down there, she cries. That, he replies portentously. Is the reason I must go. <laughs> As I said, an eight-year-old trying to write a fantasy book. Without a shred of irony, Galadriel declares to her elf platoon, The order is given. We march at first light. Mm, all right. She can't have seen the wonderful skit by Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon in the trip, where they spend a car journey wondering why warriors and terrible historical dramas always leave at first light. They never leave <laughs> at 9.30ish. <laughs> Bronwyn hasn't watched it either. She urges villagers to flee. If there are any of you here who want to live, we make for the elven tower at first light. Oh, even when the, there's no dialogue, some of the acting is abysmal. Galadriel's elf patrol, caught in a snowstorm, battle their way across the screen with their arms outstretched like a trope of mimes. <laughs> At least they're not talking. Most of the elf scenes are rigid, as two characters in robes take it in turns to dump mounds of exposition over each other's heads. An alliance with the dwarves would be the diplomatic achievement of the age, Calabrimbor, Charles Edwards from Downton Abbey, tells Elrond. Cue to a visit to Dwarf Lord. World, sorry, where Elrond challenges the prince, Owen Arthur, to a rock-breaking competition. <laughs> one of them hits a rock with a hammer, then the other one hits a rock with a hammer. This goes on for some time. The, this scene from the trailers was a rock-breaking competition? You are bloody joking! <laughs> if the cast list seems a little obscure, that's intentional. Aside from uh, Sir Lenny, the only well-known star is Beetle Merlin, who plays the King of Dwarfs. Hiring an experienced and subtle actor, even if he is in a massive prosthetic nose and filmed to appear four feet tall, might seem canny decision. It isn't. Mullen's talent simply highlights how woeful everything and everyone is. The effect is like sticking Richard Burton in an arm dram pantomime. <laughs> Uh, Burton was uh, famously expensive, of course, Cleopatra, in which he starred with future wife Elizabeth Taylor, cost $31 million, the most expensive film ever in 1963. Think of it, a mere $31 million. That would barely buy you a pair of Lenny Henry's hairy fake feet. Oh, I can't wait for this. And I believe that everything this guy wrote is true. And then imagine somebody like me, 
or you, my dear friends, Tolkien fans and aficionados, who have been reading Tolkien books since they were kids. And imagine watching this pile of donkey manure. Yeah, I can't wait to review it myself. All right, let me know in the comments down below what you think, and that will be all. Thank you very much for watching, and I'm out of here.